Basketball. When I talk with people about leadership communication, leaders say and instead of but. It's not that there's not a place for but, and it's more that so often when we use but, if we were to use and, we're leaving people open to hearing what we have to say, and we're leaving communication open. When we use but, it closes down communication, it closes people off. It causes them to feel defensive and we can make great points and make them more effectively when we say and instead. It's these small shifts, especially as coaches, as educators, as parents, that we can make all the time with a little bit of intentionality that yield much greater results. Betsy Butterick is a former college basketball coach at the University of Washington, Occidental College, and UC San Diego, in addition to having worked as the logistics manager for the Seattle Storm of the WNBA. Today, Betsy is known as the coach's coach and communication specialist. As a former coach with experience in D1, D2, D3, and the WNBA, Betsy utilizes her unique background with individuals ready to improve and teams of all kinds, from the locker room to the boardroom. As the coach's coach, Betsy helps coaches do what they've yet to do so they can be who they've yet to be. As a communication specialist, Betsy assists individuals in all facets of communication, while developing the connective skills to build relationships and sustain success. Please leave us a five-star rating and review on iTunes or wherever you listen to the show. And be sure to tell someone else in the coaching fraternity about the Hoop Heads podcast so we can continue to grow the game. Get ready to become a better communicator and make sure you have a notebook handy as you listen to this episode with the coach's coach, Betsy Butterick. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here with my co-host Jason Sunkel. And tonight we are pleased to welcome Betsy Butterick, communication specialist and coach of the coaches. Betsy, welcome to the podcast. Hey guys, thanks so much for having me on. It's great to be here. We are excited to have you on and get a chance to communicate (laughs) directly with you. (laughs) Uh, Let's start out, Betsy, by talking about how you got into the game of basketball as a kid and learn a little bit more about your basketball background. Sure. I grew up partially on the East Coast and I was nine living in Pennsylvania and went to pick up my dad from work one day. He was running a few minutes behind, and so his boss invited us to hang out in his office, and he had one of those mini basketball hoops. And I was like, oh, what's this? And he said, it's basketball. Have you ever played basketball before? I said, no. And that was the first time with a mini hoop, and I remember specifically he was teaching me, you know, think one of those mini rubber basketball. He says, like, you got to pop it. You got to pop it with your fingertips. I had no (laughs) idea what that meant, let alone on a larger (laughs) side ball. Nobody in my family played basketball, but that was my introduction to basketball. So I came to the game a little bit later than some kids do, but fell in love with it immediately and grew up playing all sports. Soccer and basketball became the main ones that I played through a club season. And then we moved to California when I was 11. And in high school in California, basketball and soccer are the same season. They're both winter sports because you can play soccer outside through the winter. So that's when I had to choose. And I arguably was better at soccer, but I loved basketball. So I chose basketball and that's what I ended up playing through high school and then through college and then got into college coaching. What was it about basketball that you really liked that that drew you to the game once you discovered it? That's a great question. I think... I don't know if if I've ever been asked that question before. I think the the variety of ways that you can play the game, similar to, I'll equate it to golf. There's so many different ways that you can hit a golf ball. And swings, if you look at the professionals on the women's side or the men's side, there's so many different looking swings, and yet all of them yield great results. And basketball, I felt like was, was similar in that way. There are so many different ways to play the game. And you look at some of the people, like Steph Curry is a great example of, you have a stereotypical size that you think of for an NBA guard, and yet you've got someone of his size and skill ability that's changing the way people perceive the game. I think a lot of what drew me to basketball was the ability to play it in a variety of ways, and it's fast-paced, and you're always learning, and that was something that I found highly engaging. Yeah, I think the fact that it's dynamic and it's not always the same, and obviously you can tell from anybody who watches basketball from game to game, the two teams that play a seven-game series and one game looks nothing like the previous right. game. And so that's something that I think draws a lot of us into the game of basketball for sure. 
So at what point when you started taking the game a little bit more seriously and you were there in California at high school, at what point did it become apparent to you that you might have a chance to play basketball in college? Truthfully, I wish it became apparent earlier. <laughs> Again, not having anyone in my family that played basketball, we didn't know anything about what it looked like for someone that had the desire to play in college. Reflectively, had I known now, or had I known then what I know now, I would have gone to a different high school. My high school coaches, great guys, but they knew nothing about how to help someone that wanted to play the game after high school. And I went to school in the Bay Area of California. Archbishop Mitty High School is the high school I should have gone to if, if I had known then how to intentionally choose a path that would set me up to be successful in college. I came to the club scene later on, so just starting my junior year. And moving to the Bay Area when I was 11, as an 11-year-old girl in Palo Alto, California, I immediately fell in love with Stanford basketball. That's where I wanted to play. That's where I wanted to go. I started going to camps as a camper from the time I was 11 through when I was a senior in high school. I didn't get recruited very heavily out of high school, but had decided, okay, I'm going to apply because if I can get admitted to Stanford, then I can have an opportunity to try out as a walk-on. So that became my goal. And I applied out of high school and I got my rejection letter in the mail and I taped it on the ceiling above my bed as motivation to get better. And I enrolled in the local junior college, Foothill Junior College, played there for a year, freshman of the year honors, applied again to Stanford, got a second rejection letter. This one came with a really nice note from the admissions <laughs> office saying, hey, Elizabeth, we realize you've applied twice now. We had a lot of sophomore transfers. Best wishes to you if you decide to apply a third time. And that was when I had a decision to make of, do I want to let go of what had been the dream since the time I was 11? I'm now 21, 20. Do I let go of the Stanford dream and take another scholarship offer to play Division One that I have on the table? Or do I try for one more time? And the great thing about getting rejected twice from Stanford is pursuing that goal set me up to be successful in other areas. So I ended up choosing to accept a Division One scholarship to a different school that wasn't Stanford. I have a twin brother and my folks put themselves through Penn State College. They both fenced there and they told us early on, you know, when we knew we were having twins, you guys can go to any school that you want to go to but you're going to have to pay for it yourself. So I thought, okay, do I try again for Stanford or do I accept a full ride to have school paid for by playing basketball? So that's what I did. And I played a year at, at Division One UMBC. And then during that year, learned very quickly that I, I wanted a higher academic experience and more time to spend on academics than I had in a Division One schedule. And so I made the decision at the end of that year to transfer, and I finished playing and finished school at Division Three Claremont McKenna. So my playing career, very non-traditional, ended up spanning junior college, Division One, Division Three. And the beautiful thing about that is, one, I was exposed to three different styles of coaching. Two, I learned that there was a lot less truth than what I was told as a high school player about the goal is division one or bust, you know, and if you can't play division one, it's not really worth playing division two or division three. Those are okay, but everyone should shoot for division one. What I found specifically in playing division three is it was no less competitive, no less joyful, but the metrics were different. So instead of our starting point guard being five, eight, five, nine, they were five, one, five, two. Instead of our center being six, 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 seven, they were 5'11", maybe six feet. So the players were smaller. It's not that they were less skilled. They were a little less quick, a little less athletic, but no less passionate, no less competitive. And I had a total blast playing Division Three. And then it was while I was in college, I had gone to Stanford camp as a camper. As soon as I graduated high school, I started working Stanford camp for Coach Tara Vanderveer as a counselor. And it was the summer between my sophomore and junior year that Coach Vanderveer approached me at camp and she said, Betsy, when you graduate, would you be interested in coming back and interning with our women's basketball program? They just started an internship program that year. So I knew as a junior in college that when I graduated, I'd be coming back to Stanford. I was thrilled about it. And it was an unpaid internship. They actually hired me as the manager as well because the NCAA rules at that time prevented interns from traveling with the team. But if you were the team manager, you could. So my year was spent not making any money, folding a lot of towels, doing a lot of kind of the grunt work in order to get the full experience. But the full experience for me 
meant I got to sit in on all the meetings. I got to help out with all the workouts because as an intern, you know, you couldn't be on the floor, you couldn't pass, but as a manager, you could. And we played Tennessee at Tennessee that year. Candace Parker was on the team at the time. I watched her dunk in the game from the baseline, and I happened to be sitting in the seat that was equal at the baseline. And I know it was scoring for the wrong team, but it was one of the cooler <laughs> things I had seen in my life at that time. And to get that opportunity to learn from Tara, and then at the year I was at Stanford, Tara's youngest sister, there's five Vanderveers, Tara's the oldest, Heidi Vanderveer is the youngest. They're the only two that coach basketball. At the time I was with Stanford, Heidi Vanderveer was coaching in the pros with the Seattle Storm under the late head coach, Dan, Ann Donovan. And so opposite seasons. So while I was at Stanford, Heidi was hanging out at Stanford helping Tara. So I got to meet Heidi and she convinced Ann to fly down for one of the home games. They interviewed me in the back hall while I was folding some towels, <laughs> getting ready for the second half and decided to hire me as the equipment manager. So I finished my year at Stanford, went right to Seattle as the equipment manager for the storm. Sue Bird, Lauren Jackson were on the team. Obviously, Ann Donovan, phenomenal head coach. So I had the opportunity then at age 23 to spend three months traveling with the team as the equipment manager. Everywhere that we went, we stayed in nice hotels. And because I had eight giant gear bags, they always booked me my own suite. So I'm 23, staying in giant suites all over the country, traveling with world-class basketball players and getting paid $60 a day cash per diem. I didn't eat $60 of food a day. I was fine with ramen. So it was a great time. I mean, I learned a lot. And then after that year with the storm, after the summer rather, with the storm, when the WNBA season ended, the University of Washington women's basketball hired an entirely new staff. I got on with that staff as the video coordinator. And then after a year at Washington, Heidi Vanderveer got out of the pros back into college, becoming the head coach at Division Three Occidental College. She asked me to come be her assistant. We were there together for four years. And then she took the head job at UC San Diego, Division Two. I went with her and was there with her for three years before stepping off the court in 2015 to do what I do now. She's still there. They just went 30 and one this past year. And in the seven years, Heidi and I coached together. We won five championships in seven years at two divisions. And we did it by never talking about winning, which was a really cool thing. All right. So there's a lot to unpack there. I got a couple of yes, questions. That I, might, I, might have to, I might have to circle back on you a couple of times here, Betsy. So first question is, the fact that you were able to, at such a young age, be surrounded by not only Hall of Fame, Hall of Fame coaches, but Hall of Fame players, mm -hmm. can you point to maybe one or two things that you learned from someone along that journey that was a revelation to you when you were in that situation? So maybe one of the professional players from the WNBA, maybe Tara Vanderveer. What just is there somebody? that you learned something from that was like, wow, this is, uh, you know, I never realized that this was something that was important. Can you point to anything like that? Absolutely. And there's so many, I think when it comes to having mentors, I hit, I hit the women's basketball jackpot in terms of being able to learn from and, and study under, so to speak, Tara and then Heidi for the amount of time that I did. I coached 14 years of summer camp for Tara. So even though I didn't work on her staff for more than a year, we've been able to have a relationship that continues today. I'm able to work with the women's basketball team there. One of the things that I learned early in my, my coaching career when I was an intern at Stanford, specifically from Tara, was the importance of flexibility. What that looked like as an intern was we would have the pre-practice meeting, you know, two or three hours before practice, and we'd go through the practice plan and I'd know exactly what needed to be set up. And sometimes that meant, okay, we're going to be using the side baskets in Maples Pavilion. So I'd go down with the string and I'd tape three-point lines onto the six side baskets. And then practice would roll around and Tara would come down and she'd look at the floor and say, oh, we're not going to do that drill anymore. Go ahead and take the tape up. And so <laughs> now you had to be ready with Tara at any point to let go of any personal investment of time or ego into what was the plan in service of what the plan is now. And I'll say Tara's a master at being very intentional about flexibility and adjusting, whether it's in a game or in practice, to what's needed now with the most or most relevant information that she has. And so learning to let go of what was in service of what is or what can be was a lesson that I learned from Tara. The second thing I learned was we were walking into Maples Pavilion before the first home game. 
and beautifully set up. The facilities, the facilities crew had done a phenomenal job. And we're walking down, and the way that, <laughs> that the stairs were positioned, the light was just right that when she looked through one of the baskets, you could see clearly there was a basketball smudge. Like it was the imprint of part of a ball <laughs> on the upper left corner. And she said, shoot, she said, you know, facilities is supposed to clean those. It looks like they missed a spot. Would you mind grabbing the ladder and the Windex and, and Windexing the backboard? I said, no problem. I'm in heels. That was the last time I wore heels. So <laughs> lesson one, you know, don't wear heels. Lesson two was it became a thing from that game on. So that was the first preseason game. And before every game, she said, Betsy, I know facilities is supposed to do it, but would you mind windexing the backboards, both of them before the game? And I said, no problem. So learning to value the details and that no job is too small and windexing the backboards because it's the details that that really drive success, whether you're paying attention to the little things in practice or to the aesthetics of the place that you practice in, the place that you play in. Those were things that I learned from Tara. When it comes to Heidi, who I spent most of my coaching career working with, and I'll say Heidi is the definition of someone that you work with, not for. And a lot of times people interchange those words, but that there is a big difference. And oftentimes, as Heidi's assistant, I would need to ask her to stop doing things that I could do so that she could do the things that I couldn't do. Like, Heidi, I know you want to help us get, get this work done or get through these recruiting calls. You need to go to the dinner with donors. They don't want to see us, your assistant. They want to see you. But, but she's that kind of person. And there's so many examples in my, my time with Heidi where um, there is no job too small. The, there were never positions within her staff. There were on the website because we were asked for her to delegate who's your first assistant, second assistant. But, but when it came to a staff, we were all equal, not just with each other, but with her. And our team felt that. And the thing I learned from Heidi when I say that we won five championships in seven years by never talking about winning, the thing that we focused on every single year was making sure that each player in our program felt seen, valued, and appreciated regardless of skill level. And what happens when you do that with a group of people in any team, whether it's athletics or business or family, when people feel seen, valued, and appreciated, they tend to be happy people. Happy people tend to give you their best. And that's what we got from the teams that we coach is we got their best. And when you're getting your best from everybody in your team, you tend to win a lot of games. But we never talked about winning. We always talked only about opportunities for success. What could we do today? What was controllable by us, by our team, to give ourselves the greatest opportunity to succeed? And that mindset really shaped who we were as a program, but also how successful we became. Okay, going backwards from that question, yep. then did you ever play for a coach who had sort of an opposite mentality, kind of an <laughs> old school coach where somebody who coached through intimidation and fear and holding things over players' heads, and then you, you kind of already have described why the former is, is more effective, but did you ever play for somebody who didn't have that philosophy and what was that experience like for you? Absolutely. And more than one somebody. I think there were, there were three <laughs> formative somebodies that I played for. We won't mention names here, but there was one who, and this was a club coach and my last name is Butterick and he could yell my last name in a way that not even my parents, I don't think have ever yelled my name for any reason. And, and he was a screamer of a coach. And I learned from him because really every situation that you have in life, you learn who you want to be more of and who you like to be less of. Or specifically when we talk about coaching, the kind of coach you're going to be and the kind of coach you swear to never be. So this was one of those I swear to never be. <laughs> what I found, you know, when you relate it to communication, and I call myself a communication specialist intentionally, to say that I'm an expert would, I think, be very egotistical. And it would assume that there's a, a cap on everything that we can learn about communication. What I learned from this coach in terms of communication was when you yell all the time, when you scream all the time, people tune it out and it becomes less effective. And you can ask any player that I've ever coached. I was never a yeller as a coach, but when I did yell, the players that I coached can tell you to this day exactly what I yelled about because it was always for a very good reason and it was very specific. So yelling in itself is not as effective when you do it all the time. But it was interesting because, you know, I played for this club coach in high school. Years down the road, 
I'm at a tournament recruiting, and this is when I was at Occidental College, and across the gym, that same coach yelled my last name, and it was like I was 15 again. <laughs> I just turned my head, and I was like, <gasps> you know, he's yep. still that great kind of thing. And, it, it, you know, we exchanged hugs and, and caught up, but, but it's interesting that that impact that it has, and one of the things I talk a lot about in the championship communication workshop that I do with teams and with athletic departments is about rephrasing in the positive and how positive environments outperform negative environments. And this is research-based, not my research, but but the collection of research and studies done over times and with teams of all kinds, whether it's athletic teams, college and professional, but also corporate teams, and how positive athletes, positive environments, positive leaders, they make better decisions under pressure. How can we as coaches rephrase and reframe what we say to be more positive and to intentionally create that environment. Examples basketball wise, things we say, we say as coaches always, don't foul, right? And I'll give the example when I'm talking with coaches of, you know, raise your hand if you've ever had the experience where it's a close game, there's five or six seconds left, you call a timeout, your team's up by two, the other team has to inbound the ball, bring it the length of the floor. The only thing you can't do is foul. And so you tell your team, guys, we're in a great position, we've got this. The only thing we can't do is foul. Whatever you do, don't foul. Don't reach, don't foul. And everyone nods their head. Yeah, yeah, okay, coach, sounds great. They're hyped. They go back out there. The ball gets inbounded. Two seconds go by, foul. And it's like the exact same thing that you told them can't happen is what happens. And the reason that happens is because the brain on a subconscious level doesn't process negatives the same way we understand them when we speak them. On a subconscious level, when we hear a negative, it acts as a little blip on the radar something that doesn't register quite right, and we pay more attention to what comes next. So on a subconscious level, don't foul becomes foul. You know, don't stop playing becomes stop playing. So we take all these different examples, and I love sitting in on practices, listening to communication, and how often well-intentioned coaches use negative phrases. So how can you rephrase those in the positive? Don't stop playing becomes keep playing. Don't foul means keep your player in front or move your feet. But finding ways, small ways, to make subtle shifts in language that translate into big results and positive results. Do you ever have coaches, do you ever film coaches and then watch the film of them coaching with them? Because that seems like something that, based on what you just described, when you're talking about rephrasing or getting you to think about the way that you're talking or the type of instruction that you're giving, it seems that if a coach, a lot of times may not even know that they're using mm-hmm. those that kind of negative phrasing. So it seems like if they were able to see themselves on film, and I've never done this with myself, but I think it would be tremendously fascinating <laughs> to, to train a camera on me and see if some of the things that I like to talk about that I think I do, whether mm-hmm. or not I, whether or not I'm actually as good at them as I sometimes think I am. So have you ever done that with any of the coaches that you've worked with or any of the programs? I have, and, and you're absolutely right. I like to say in coaching individuals, awareness is a prerequisite for change. We can't change what we're unaware of. And just like we would use film with our players, so often you can say something to an individual of, you know, you keep traveling because you're moving your pivot foot before you put the ball down. They say, no, I'm not, or they can't feel it, right? But when you can show them on film, the nice thing about that is people in general are often uncomfortable when you say, I'm going to film you. But so often coaches film practice regularly and all I need is audio from like we we can even scrap the video part and that's an interesting exercise sometimes is I'll play back a recording of practice with no video and just ask coaches tell me what you hear you know whether we're talking about their tone or we're talking about their word choice or or are they at a certain volume all the time are they asking rhetorical questions I often tell coaches be intentional about your questions don't ask your team questions that you don't want an answer for you're training them to respond. You're training them to articulate in times when you really want an answer. We blow that out of the water and we lessen its value when we ask rhetorical questions. Is that as hard as we can go? Well, do you want them to answer or not? If you know it's not as hard as they can go, don't ask the question and make a statement. And we talk about that rephrasing in the positive. When I ask coaches to listen to their practice, when you tell people what you want them to do instead of what you don't want them to do, you are much more likely to get the result that you're looking for. So instead of saying, don't do, don't do, don't do, no, let's not tell them what not to do. Tell them what you want them to do. And we're shortening that distance between the behavior that's happening now and the behavior that we want to see for the result that we're looking to get. But I'll often use the audio from a practice. Sometimes the video, if we're talking in relation to communication about 
how am I showing up to my players? What's my body language communicating despite what my tone is communicating, despite what my words are saying? How am I showing up physically? And how can we make shifts in our body language and the way that we're expressing ourselves to better communicate the message that we intend to send? The thing I like most is I'll, I'll often tell coaches, is it okay if I observe practice? And I won't be specific as saying whether I'm going to observe player communication or coach communication or what I'm looking for. It's a little easier for coaches to say yes to that than, hey, can I film you? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I would think so. What, what I'll do is I'll take notes. And I did this recently with the, the University of Iowa women's field hockey team, highly competitive team, love their team, love their staff. They have a legitimate chance at winning the national championship this next year. And they called me in, their head coach called, and she said, uh, you know, Betsy, we've done so much work intentionally on helping ourselves to be successful and to give ourselves the best shot as, as being as competitive as we can be. The one thing I think that we're missing is our kids love each other so much that they are not having the difficult conversations that they need to have to hold each other accountable. They're all bought in. They want to be accountable to our code of conduct that we've set and the things that we've said we're committed to as a program, but, but they just like each other so much that they're not having the difficult conversations. Can you come in and help us do that? I said, absolutely. Did two workshops with their team, but I, I said, would it be okay to come in the day before and, and just watch practice? And they said, absolutely. So I watched a practice and then I watched a weight training session and then went to dinner with just the staff. And it ended up being this two hour conversation of, I, I told them all the notes that I had taken and said, you know, this is what was said. Here's an option for what you could say and why it might matter. And I say this whenever I do a workshop, everything that I have to offer is merely a suggestion. Don't take it as doctrine. Take whatever serves you and make it your own. Whenever I speak, and I think a lot of how I present comes from my experience of being a student athlete and then being a coach and oftentimes sitting in a room where the presenter the information they had to share was good, but it only worked while they were there or you had to buy the next something in order for it to be of continuous value. And I decided early on when I started speaking that I had two goals in mind. The first is that everyone that leaves the room is a little more intentional about their communication than before they came in. And the second is whatever I come into a room with, I feel it's my responsibility before I leave to make sure that the people in the audience feel like it's theirs because I don't want them to need me. Maybe from a marketing perspective, that's a really poor choice, but, <laughs> but I don't want them to need me. What I want them to do is be able to use what they learned right away to improve their communication, knowing that improved communication improves every other aspect of our lives. All right, so now it's my turn to circle back. A few things you just said there. So the first thing that comes to mind was when you were talking about like listening to the game or practice and just turning the video off. When Mike and I started this podcast like a year and a half ago, like first started talking about it and doing it, or I guess it was a year ago, we'd go back and listen to the podcast and we'd hear, mm -hmm. oh man, I can't believe I keep saying these words over and over again. <laughs> and, and it was, yep. it was just, you know, we don't, we don't know what we're doing. You know, we're just kind of going and seeing, but now we kind of have it baked in our brain on how to handle communication. So that that's a really good piece. The other piece that I found funny that you mentioned is like looking at behaviors on video. Uh, this past season, I, I coached middle school basketball and, and I filmed all my games. And the kids would say, oh, during the games, you always do this. Like you put your, your hand up there <laughs> over your eyes when something bad happens. They're like, I don't do that. I don't do that. Well, we're sitting here watching film and there, lo and behold, like, I was doing it. I totally it. do so, that. <laughs> yeah. So, so the kids, would be, the kids, the kids pointed something out to me that I didn't believe them. And then when I went back and watched the film, there it was. So I definitely learned how to, to better like, like show bodily, like, my bodily mannerisms and make sure that the kids didn't think that, oh man, he's really mad at me because he did this. Right. So I think right. both those points are really good. Yeah. My kids always laugh at me. They always say, dad, whenever something bad happens and you're coaching, you always put your hands on the top of your head. Mm -hmm. Why do you do that? You know? And it's just, and I don't, I mean, like, sometimes, I no I don't, <laughs> sometimes I know, sometimes I notice it, but probably I would guess I notice it two times out of 10, maybe that I do it. And those are things that, I, I like the word that you used, which is intentional. I yeah. think as coaches, one of the things that, and it, whether it's communication, whether it's body language, whether it's what you're actually planning to practice, how you conduct yourself in a game, your strategy, whatever, I think coaches are way, way more effective when they're very intentional. And we just kind of go in and fly by the seat of our pants. We tend to not do things nearly as well, no matter what it is. And, and I think the word intentional is key to being a successful coach for sure.
Absolutely. And that's I'm, one of the things that I'll I'll start with often, especially when I do the, the championship communication workshop, is the reality is we as individuals in or outside of sport, we spend roughly 83 percent of our day involved in some form of communication. And yet we tend to only be intentional about our communication when we have something important to say when we're preparing to have a difficult conversation, when we're preparing to write an email to our coach or a, a teacher or a parent or whatever it happens to be, there's so few spaces in our day that we're intentional about our communication. So again, my goal is that whoever's in the room, by the time you leave, you're a little bit more. It's not that you have to be perfect all the time, but if we're a little bit more intentional about our communication in that 83%, we all stand to benefit. So absolutely, intentionality in any aspect of life probably yields positive results across the board. All right. So if somebody has difficulty with body language, mm -hmm. what do you suggest to them to help them to improve their body language on the sidelines as a coach? What are some things that they can do other than being conscious all the time of what they're doing, which obviously we know in game situations isn't always going to be possible because coaches get emotional and things happen. Mm -hmm. So what do you get them to think about outside of the pressure cooker of a game to help them to be in better control of their body language and the messages that they're sending. Mm -hmm. uh, recommendation number one, straight jacket. I mean, like, <laughs> you, <laughs> no, I kid. I going back to the video. So any kind of coaching that I do, whether it's on body language or communication or whatever the issue is, that's important to the individual. It, it always starts with awareness and awareness can come about through various means Sometimes it's self-reflection, sometimes it's observation, sometimes it's more of a 360, asking other people to tell you, you know, what do you see in what I do? So when your kids are saying, dad, you always put your hands on your head. Getting input from other people about how we're showing up is, is typically the first place that we'll start. If we're using video, I'll ask them, let's say we're working on a coach with body language, specifically negative body language, I'll ask them to send me, you know, send me three game clips. And I won't necessarily tell them why, you know, let's start to look at you as a coach. And then I'll clip out body language. And then I'll show them essentially a highlight reel of the negative body language and have them watch it. And then ask them as a player, if that was your coach, how do you feel right now? When you can put someone in somebody else's shoes, I'm huge on perspective, anything that imparts a larger perspective, a different perspective, a broader perspective, I find value in. And that's one of the techniques that I'll use is to show people how they're showing up and then ask them, one, how do you feel if this is what you're seeing from anybody? And it helps if you pick someone close to them. So if your spouse acted this way, how would you feel? If your parent acted this way, if your child acted this way, and then give them something relative to compare it to, but illustrating to them in a factual way, which video does, it's not me saying, oh, I observed you, blah, blah, blah. No, like they can see, oh, I'm doing this. And then how does that feel? And then asking the follow-up question, what do you want your players to feel? You know, well I, well, I want them to feel confident. I want them to feel like I support them. I want them to feel like they're capable. Great. Does the body language you're currently using convey that message? Typically the answer is no. So how can we change it in a way that would demonstrate that? What is confidence look like in terms of body language and I'll have them show me. Sometimes they don't know and that's okay. That's where the learning starts. And then I might pull clips of coaches with positive body language of any sport or people in general. That's the thing I love about communication. It's not sport specific. It's not gender specific. It's not age specific. Anybody can demonstrate great communication, but pulling examples that are relevant to them. Maybe it's people that they aspire to be like or people that they admire or mentors that they have and showing them what's possible. And then from there, it's simply reshaping behavior, which sometimes it's a replacement behavior of, okay, you always put your hand on your head when something goes wrong. The next time something goes wrong, I want you to tap your thigh. So I'm giving you something to do that's down low, that's in a completely different direction. You know, it's like, oh, miss that one. And we do this with phrases, we do this with body language, but there's absolutely ways to reshape the way that we're showing up it always starts with awareness and then it starts with a desire to change. I can tell someone you'd be a more effective coach if you did this. They're not going to change until they have a personal reason for wanting to improve. Sometimes in the people that I coach, it's they're at risk of use, losing their job. Sometimes it's they've been doing this for so long and kids have changed and they're looking for a better way to connect with today's student athlete. There's always a reason, but it's not until that reason is personal that people really step into a new way of being because change is hard. 
It doesn't have to be, but most of us fear it. Most of us find it difficult to do. My job in working with individuals is to make it as easy as possible while also helping them be as effective as they can be. Yeah, I think when you become aware of what you're doing, it becomes much easier to change it. And until you're aware of what you're doing, the likelihood that you're going to change or want to change is not going to be very high. Let's talk about how besides we you mentioned one thing, which was changing your phraseology from talking to your players as a coach where you're framing it in the negative or don't do this, don't right. do that, and, and flipping that into a positive statement. What are some other subtle language things that a play, that a coach can do to help the communication with the player? And I guess I'm talking at this point uh, in game or in practice communication. We can get to the relate building relationship piece of it maybe next, but just to continue with the theme of we kind of been focusing on the competitive environment. What mm-hmm. are some things in a competitive environment that coaches can do in the heat of the moment to better communicate with their players? We talk a lot. I say we. I talk a lot with people. <laughs> that's that's actually one of the points. I'll, there's a slide in in the championship communication presentation about I, you, and we, and how, as coaches specifically, being intentional about how we use those three words. If you listen to championship teams, high performing teams, players and coaches, most often on those teams speak in the language of we. Again, I'll go back to Steph Curry. But you've got the women's softball championship on right now. When you listen to the pitcher from UCLA talk about her great game and the fact that she, you know, hit the the home run that sent them into the the series championship, most of her responses are all about we. We've been focused a lot on this all week. We've been talking about our team does a great job. Using I, I is the fastest way to put someone on the, or sorry, you. When we talk about you, you is the fastest way to put someone on the defensive. The reason being the individual that you're speaking to, when you start a sentence with you, they don't know yet if what you're going to say after you is positive or negative and we're primed to defend. So using I, and I'll have this statement, like if I told you, um, Mike, you need to, you need to crash the boards harder. What does that imply to you? If I said at halftime, we're down by one, Mike, you need to crash the boards harder. How do you, that would how does imply that to me that, that that would apply to me that everyone else is doing what the coach wants, but I'm not. So I need to right. start doing that. That's how I would You're take it. You're not doing your job. Okay. What if I said instead, Mike, I need you to crash the boards harder. Now I'm thinking that my coach believes that I can do it. And so he's asking me to do something that he thinks that I'm capable of doing. Yes. So the difference is. You, when I said you need to crash the boards harder, that implies you're not doing your job. It sounds like an accusation. When I say I need you to, now I'm making a request. And you you said that same thing, like it feels like I'm being asked to do something to help the team. And then when I say we need to crash the boards harder, now that's more collective. It's less specific, but there's that collaborativeness to it. Um, there's that shared vision, that shared mission. So being intentional about how we use the words you, I, and we, and who we use them with. It's like public speaking, knowing your audience, knowing your players as coaches and the language that they need to be spoken to, how you can be most effective with the individual. There's, you had asked earlier about, you know, did you have any coaches that were not so positive? And it was my, my um, Claremont McKenna coach, Jody Burton, who I believe is in the Hall of Fame for Division Three for as one of the winningest coaches of all time. She passed the 500 mark. Great friend, uh, a second mother to me in many ways. Love Jody. She was just at my wedding in April, and she told me when I graduated. She said, "Beth, I have to apologize for all the times I yelled at you when it wasn't your fault." <laughs> I said, "Yeah, coach. Why? Did you, why did you do that?" She said, "Well, I yelled at you for things that weren't your fault because I knew you could take it, and there were other people on the team that couldn't." And so playing that role, and I'm not, I'm not advocating that coaches go out and find that player who can take it that you can yell at, because you can't yell at other people. But being, again, intentional about how can I most effectively communicate to the individuals on my team, specifically when things aren't going well. There's that phrase, winning is a great deodorant. It's easier to communicate to people and to resolve misunderstandings when things are going well. It's when things aren't going well. How do we communicate under pressure? And where are opportunities to be most effective? One of the things that that's crucial is, especially when people are not feeling successful or not feeling confident, is the ability to validate. 
And that's something that, you know, we said we wanted our players to be seen, valued, and appreciated regardless of skill level. That acknowledgement piece of, you know, you, your best shooters miss their last 12 shots and they sub out and their head's hanging down. They don't want to look you in the eye. They're embarrassed. They're pissed off. Whatever it happens to be. And saying to them, like, hey, this sucks right now. Like, I, this is hard. And the only way to, sh- to, to get out of a slump is to shoot yourself out of it. One of the things when people get subbed out, I was talking with a, a coach the other day at the college level specifically when I was working with Heidi, players would sub out and they would go down the bench and they'd high five their teammates and then they'd come back and they'd sit in the empty chair that was next to the one I was sitting in. And I'd talk with them about things they did well and then one thing to work on next time they went back in. Oftentimes, especially at the lower levels, we'll see kids sub out and the coach is so busy coaching the team and there's a lack of assistance or they have other jobs. And so the kids just go and they sit down and they don't know why they came out and they're starting to wonder, did I do something wrong? You know, is, is coach mad at me? Um, why am I not playing as much as I think I should? So being able to in the moment when you have the opportunity and I realize not all sports or staffs do, but anytime you can communicate in the moment what's working. And then what can be improved upon or where we stand to 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 be a little bit better. Sometimes I hear coaches come out and they say, you need to do this. You need to do this. You need. And it's like they just get negative, negative, negative. While they were out there, there's likely some things they did well. Acknowledge those as well. Like we can't get the behavior or the best out of the people that we're trying to coach when we continuously beat them down. So acknowledgement and validation are huge. And it doesn't mean you have to make stuff up. It doesn't mean you have to be soft. You can be real with people. But if you're going to be real with them, be real about the good and the bad. Sue Inquist, mentor, friend of mine, she always says, catch them doing it right. You know, be intentional about catching people doing the thing that you want them to do and vocalize that publicly. I think it's a great point. I love what you said about especially at the lower levels where you might only have one coach and no assistant right. and kids come out of the game and they go and sit down on the bench and the coach ignores them, not because they're willfully ignoring them, but just because they're attempting they're to coach the game and what's going on in the players on the floor. And I know that that's something I try to do. And typically I've been able to, I've been fortunate when I coach my own kids at the lower levels and I have used to be an assistant varsity coach at the high school level for a long time. And so I was in that role that you described where players would come out of the game and they'd sit down next to me. And then I'd talk about what went on and maybe why the head coach pulled them out of the game or what they could do better the next time. But when I'm coaching now as a head coach for my kids teams, typically either if I do have an assistant, uh, I'll still sometimes go and turn my back to the action out on the floor and talk to a particular kid when they come out of the game, just about something that I saw that they did well, something that I saw that they could do better the next time, something that I want them to change next time they go out. But it's hard. It's hard to pull yourself away from what you're seeing out on the floor, even if it's only for 10 seconds to just impart something to that kid. Because to your point, you know, you you may lose them because now the kid's sitting on the bench thinking, well, why do I am out of the game? And what what was coach thinking there? And did I make a mistake? And suddenly now my confidence gets rattled. And just by spending five or 10 seconds with them to say, hey, you did this really well, or, you know, here's where you should have gone on that play. And next time when you go in, I want you to do this. That's something that I think is invaluable to that kid who's come out of the game. So the next time they go in, they're going to be ready to be at their best. And coaches, again, it goes back to what we said earlier, which is, you have to be intentional about that because I know if I'm not intentional about turning around and talking to those kids that have come out of the game, I'm just going to continue to go right on coaching the action out on right. the floor. And it, it's natural. And, and I talk often with people about this idea of intention versus impact, right? We don't have the intention that I'm not going to talk to this kid because I'm mad at them. But the impact of not speaking to them, not saying anything is they could possibly go to the end of the bench, not know why they came out spiral in their heads about what happened and by the end of the game they're thinking coach doesn't like me when the reason you sub them out is because they just put in a 6-4 kid and so you wanted to take your 4-11 kid off the floor because they weren't going to be successful guarding that player you did them a favor you did something to protect them and they're sitting there thinking coach doesn't like me so intention versus impact and, and how we can navigate that space so that we are continually sending the message that we intend to send and it's having the desired impact. Registration is now open at www.headstartbasketball.com for this summer's Head Start Basketball Camps. We'll be hosting camps this summer in Strongsville, Westlake, Avon Lake, Oberlin, Brunswick, Highland Heights, Mentor, and Hudson. 
At Head Start Basketball, we care deeply about making a positive impact on the lives of young basketball players, both on and off the court. It's through building strong relationships with our players, parents, and coaching staff that we are able to use the game of basketball to enrich the lives of those we interact with, both inside and outside of our organization. We believe that our attention to detail, our growth mindset, and our commitment to lifelong learning allows us to help our players achieve their fullest potential. We are passionately committed to providing players, parents, and coaches with everything they need to reach their goals. These core values run through everything we do. Check out our website, www.headstartbasketball.com, and discover why you should attend a Head Start Basketball Camp this summer. Hope to see you there. All right, I want to ask you about this. This is something that we've talked with some other coaches about, and I want to kind of get your feel for it, and that is the clarity of language that a coach uses when they're giving instruction and speaking about whether or not you're talking in general terms or specific terms that a player can actually turn into an action. So, for example, if I'm the coach and I'm standing on the sideline and I would say, all right, guys, we're going to play hard or come on, D up. Or, mm -hmm. you know, I would th those kinds of things that are very, very general that coaches spend a lot of time on the sideline saying those kinds of things, or we have to move. Okay. Yeah. We understand. We understand <laughs> yeah, we have to move. To but... play the game of basketball. <laughs> Absolutely. But you get what I'm saying here that talk a little bit about how important it is to, as a coach, to give your players specific actions yep. that they can take yep. rather than just these general statements that don't really mean anything. That if I'm a player and I hear that out on the floor, I, I mean, I can't turn that into anything actionable. Right. Exactly. And, and you nailed it on the head there. The ability to be specific with our language and also to take action. And there's two places I'm going to go with this. If I forget one, say, Betsy, remember you said you were going to say two things. Sounds good. I'm going to, <laughs> between the two of us, we'll try to remember. Okay. I appreciate it. One each. The first thing is, and when I do the, the, and I know I keep mentioning this one, there's several workshops that I do. The one I do most often is championship communication. And I love it. It's the original workshop that I created related to communication. But the start of that workshop covers six barriers to communication. And the reason I start with that is because if we can better understand where communication tends to break down and how that happens, we as communicators are better able to avoid these areas from the outset or recognize them when they happen. And the six barriers that I cover are context, tone, trust, timing, clarity, and word choice. So that clarity piece is in there. And with the clarity piece, and the workshops I do, again, from being a student athlete and then being a coach, they're highly interactive. The worst thing in the world is when you walk into a room and for an hour and a half, you're sitting there while someone's talking at you. Absolutely. <laughs> and there's just slides. Absolutely. It's, it's terrible. So it's all very interactive. I'm a big fan of experiential learning and the Socratic method. And the exercise that I do for clarity is... I'll break the room up into teams. I'll give them each a note card. I'll put four minutes on the clock and I'll say, you have four minutes as a team to write instructions for making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for someone that's never made one before. That's and I awesome. bring with me a loaf of bread, a jar of peanut butter, a jar of jelly, a knife, a napkin, and a plate. And I say, you don't need to go to the store. I've gone to the store for you. These are the items that you have to work with. Write instructions for making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for someone that's never made one. They do that. We continue on with the barriers. We continue on with the rest of the workshop. And at some point later in the session when they're doing another group activity, I flip through the cards and I look for the one I can take the most literally. And <laughs> at the end, the very last exercise we close with is I'll ask for someone from that team. I'll start to read the card and I'll say, who's, you know, whose card is this? Because they don't write names on it. And I'll ask someone to come up and I said, you know, I need you to help me with this exercise. Can you read the card to me exactly as it's written? The reason this is my favorite activity is I've probably done this over 80 times now. It has never ended the same way. And it's the perfect example of how we think we're being very clear. And yet there's so many ways things can be interpreted. So people will say, you know, grab two pieces of bread. Well, I'll grab them, like crunch them together. <laughs> and even if they say open the bag, if they don't say, you know, grab two pieces of bread from the front. Like, I'll just reach through, tear up in the middle of the bag and grab two pieces of bread. They'll say, smash the two sides together. It gets really messy. I've ended up with the peanut butter and jelly jars inside the loaf of bread, inside the bag. You know, they'll say, open the jar, but they won't say how to take off the lid. I had one high school group <laughs> that said, um, with a flick of the wrist to put the jelly on the, and I flung that jelly right on the wall with a flick of the wrist. So there's so many ways that this can go. And it's a really great example of, 
And the takeaway point is if it's this easy to screw up something as simple as a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, how much easier is it to screw up communication? When we think we're being clear, there's likely something that we can do if we're a little more intentional to make sure that our message is being received as intended. So that's point number one about clarity. Point number All two. Right, so wait, before you go to point yeah. number two, Jason has something and I have a story that I want to share with you that sure. I don't know if you've ever seen it before, but it might be something that you might want to try too. So I'm going to let so, Jason so, go first. So really quick, I teach fourth grade math and I do this every single year. Like one of my first lessons, I have the kids walk me through a problem and primarily it's multiplication because that's what we start the year with. And I'll tell the kids, hey, I need you to tell me how you would exactly solve this problem. I do step by step what you said with peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> And half the time, I don't even know what I'm going to, it's always different. No matter what happens, I'll get yep. a kid. It doesn't tell me that tells me to do something wrong. They'll be like, move this here or put this underneath. So then I, instead of putting it directly underneath, I put it like Under all the way table. at the bottom of the page <laughs> or I put it, I, or I take an expo marker and write it on the floor. And they're like, no, no, no. Underneath then like directly underneath. So like, it's like, oh, well, you didn't point, say that. <laughs> as soon as you said that, I was like, that's what I do in math every single that's day. Awesome. Beginning of the year. So. We try to keep, teach them to properly communicate because obviously that's one thing these kids nowadays, uh, I, we harp on it a little bit here sometimes, but they just don't know how to communicate with one another or with adults, I think, because they're so stuck in their phones and stuck in their own like digital world that they don't know how to communicate. So it's really important. Well, and Jason, let's come back to that. So table that, but remind me because I, the newest workshop I designed is called Relating to Today's Student Athlete. And it's all about how we can more effectively coach Generation Z, our youngest generation, the oldest of whom is now roughly a sophomore or junior in college. But I want to come back to that because that's something that I'm hearing more and more frequently. Kids these days, kids these days. Yes, kids these days are different. And when we understand those differences, we can more effectively coach them. And I'd love to tell you guys how. That's cool. All right. Here's my little story. So I think I can't remember now where I heard this, but I know it was from an after school program in in like an inner city school. And what this person did and they they were uh, attempting to get kids to understand how to better communicate and interact with one another. And the activity that this person did with the group was he had everyone pair off and then one person was holding a water bottle and the other partner didn't have the water bottle. And he said, okay, you have 20 seconds to get the water bottle from the other person. And so, you know, all the kids are looking at each other and he said, he said, go. And then in those 20 seconds, he said, people were just killing each other, trying to rip the water bottle out of the other kid's hand and you mm. know, punching them and, you know, rat tackling them, trying to tear the water bottle out of their hands. 20 seconds ends. And he says, okay, let's, you know, stop and reflect on, you know, how that went. And they're talking about how they tried to get it and what they attempted to do. And he's like, here's another way that it could have happened. And so he had a partner and him and the partner are there and his partner has the water bottle and he's the one without it. And somebody else says, go. And he says, could I please have the water bottle? Right. And his, and his, partner, just <laughs> handed, his partner just handed him the water bottle. Use and, your words. <laughs> yeah, use your words. So I thought like that was... Uh, something that from a communication standpoint, you know, you, you went into an activity or you went into a thought, uh, you know, this situation thinking of it in one way. And yet by using different words and just reframing the situation, oh. we ended up with a totally different result. And I always thought that that was something that was very, very interesting. I haven't tried that with my team. I'd, I'd like to try it. And it just, just talking to you kind of popped it back into my head from my distant memory. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. And, and I recognize where this was going while you were telling the story. But to that point, like anytime we can show people versus tell people, it becomes more powerful. And that's oftentimes what I try to teach. I can stand in front of a group and talk about communication all day, but when they experience it, the aha is greater and it's longer lasting. All right. Your so second point on clarity. Go ahead. Okay. Second point on clarity is, oh, there's a series of videos on YouTube and this started in 2017. It started out of need. So I just done a presentation at Stanford. One of their assistants called a friend of mine who was coaching at UC Santa Barbara at the time. She said, Betsy just did a great presentation with our team. You guys need to bring her in. So my friend at UC Santa Barbara calls. She's like, hey, I just heard you did a great presentation. I want to tell our head coach about you. Can you send me some information? I did. She called me back about a week later, and she said, our head coach decided to go with someone she knows. And I said, hey, it, that totally makes sense. And that, for me, at the time, begged the question, how can I give people 
a sense of what it would be like to work with me without them ever having met me. And that was the start of a video series called ACTS, which stands for Active Communication Technique. There are, I think, 25 or 26 of them currently. And they're all on YouTube if you search Betsy Butterick. And yeah, even if you just put Betsy Butterick ACT videos or Betsy Butterick YouTube, I think they're going to come up. But ACT 22 relates to this clarity point, And the title of it is called The Question We Don't Ask, directly related to what you were saying earlier, Mike, about, you know, we need to move general statements. As my ex in my experience as a coach, and I think most coaches can relate to this, at some point you have a beginning of season meeting where you're talking about your team values or your team goals. And all of the videos, all the acts are roughly two minutes or less. They're meant to be short, easily digestible things. And even though some of them come from a sports context, they're presented in such a way that they can be beneficial to anyone. And the whole point is to give people something they can do today to impact the way that they communicate and connect with other people. And Act 22, the question we don't ask, is specifically around this point of clarity. And the example I use in the video is, let's say we, we decide that we're going to be a team that's committed to great energy. And we talk about the definition of energy so that everyone's on the same page. That's where most people stop. The question we don't ask is, what does that look like? And when you think about a team, if you've got even just an extroverted kid, an introverted kid, giving great energy is going to look very different for those two individuals. So even though we might agree on what energy means by definition, what does that look like? When you ask that question, now you're getting into the specific behaviors that can define expectations that allow you to hold people accountable to getting the results that you say you're committed to. And I think when we talk about clarity, and giving actionable steps, not only being clear with our language, being specific, but giving our team, what does that look like? Conveying that information so that we're talking about the behaviors that we want to see that are likely going to generate the result we're looking to get. Yeah, I agree. So for example, if we're saying, hey, we need to play hard. Well, in this case, maybe that means I need you to just sprint the floor in transition and outrun your opponent. Okay, right, that's something exactly. tangible that I can do versus just playing hard. And I think that's where, again, that clarity comes in, where when you're a coach, you have to be intentional about what you're saying, and you have to make sure that you're giving specific instruction as opposed to these just general platitudes that don't really mean anything. And right. when you do that, you're going to get better results from your players than if you're just speaking in generalities on the sidelines all the time, for sure. Absolutely. And and I talk about this often. It, again, it's the small shifts in language that make the biggest difference. It's not that there's anything wrong with how most coaches communicate. It's simply that there is the opportunity and the option, if they choose, to be better. And one of the things that comes up often, I'll ask people when I present, when you finish teaching a drill, let's say you're a coach, and I'll ask you, Mike and Jason, when you finish teaching a drill or teaching anything new, even as a math teacher, Jason, what's typically the question that you'll ask after you've taught something new? Any questions? Yep. Are there any questions? What's the difference if instead I were to say, what questions do you have? Well, any questions to me means if I'm sitting there in the audience, I'm probably thinking, eh, I don't really have any questions. And but if you frame it the other way, then I'm thinking, OK, yeah, maybe I do have a question or two that I could ask. And if you get a whole team or a whole classroom full of kids thinking oh, I might have a question or two. Now, suddenly you have 30 questions or 40 questions, depending on how many people you have on your team or in your classroom. And you're much more likely to get the response that you're looking for, which is giving those players or those students clarification on some of the things you said that they may not have gotten the first time through with your instruction, whatever that instruction may have been. Right. So whether we're a teacher or we're a coach, we're always pressed for time. And being effective with our time and practice is one of the things that coaches run up against all the time. They end up doing a drill that they had slated for five minutes for 15 minutes because people have questions or they don't get it or they keep messing up on things. Or maybe we as coaches weren't clear. The difference in those two questions is to the last point that you made. When you remove a barrier, when I say, are there any questions, Someone first has to admit that there's something they didn't understand and then have the courage to ask the question. When you say what questions do you have, that language assumes that there are questions and instead creates a more welcoming environment for people to ask that question. It's essentially saying, I know there's questions out there. Tell me what they are so we can get those out of the way. But it's small shifts like that. The difference between saying but and and. 
And it's so often that when we say but, we could say and without lessening the importance of what we just said. And oftentimes we miss that opportunity. What happens when people hear but, but acts like this giant eraser. Jason, Mike, I think your podcast is awesome. You're doing a really great job, but, and then it's like, what? <laughs> you know, like everything positive I just said, gone. And now I'm paying attention to, but what's the but? When I say, Mike and Jason, I think your podcast is awesome. You're doing a really great job. And if you were to ask this question differently, I think you'd get a lot of value out of the people that you interview or bring on as guests. When you say and instead of but, and when I talk with people about leadership communication, leaders say and instead of but. It's not that there's not a place for but, and it's more that so often when we use but, if we were to use and, we're leaving people open to hearing what we have to say, and we're leaving communication open. When we use but, it closes down communications. It closes people off. It causes them to feel defensive. And we can make great points and make them more effectively when we say and instead. It's these small shifts, especially as coaches, as educators, as parents, that we can make all the time with a little bit of intentionality that yield much greater results. It's amazing to me. And I think you're 100% right. And I look at the word but as being a stop and the word mm -hmm. and as being a continue. Mm -hmm. So if I say yes, but, or I say yes, and, the the tone of that is completely is completely different and i think what strikes me about everything that we're talking about is it comes back to in a lot of cases being intentional and then it also is amazing that just these small subtle shifts that we may not even be aware of as the person who's on the listening mm -hmm. end of the communication that we may not even take that into account or really notice when someone says yes but or they say yes and but we are able to see, I just did it. <laughs> Jason started laughing at me as I said that. <laughs> now, you know, and you now can't I know, it. see, and now I'm, I'm, I'm being intentional. Now you're going to drive yourself nuts. And this is, I always tell people, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but this is oh, important. Right. And whether I'm coaching an individual or I'm working with a team, once you know better, there's a responsibility to do better. What always happens when, whether it's, you know, this and, but thing is a perfect example. I also, <laughs> So often when I'm speaking with groups, and it's as simple as asking people to, to introduce themselves, and they'll stand up and say, uh, my name is Betsy. They'll start with, uh, it's like, you know your name. You've had your name for your entire right, life. Right. And this came to light when I had gone to Starbucks on a recruiting trip. And the barista, when I picked up my drink for the name, it said, uh, Betsy. And I was like, oh, I could probably be a little bit better here. That's funny. And people do it all the time. And again, once they hear themselves do it, they're like, crap. So when we're awareness is a prerequisite for change and then once we're aware automatically there's this leveling off of like i am so bad at this i do this all the time and i offer in those moments for people okay you have a choice you can either beat yourself up for doing what you're in the habit of doing or congratulate yourself for recognizing that you've just done it and say hey i have an option right now because i recognize this to make a different decision so congratulate yourself for recognizing it instead of beating yourself up for doing the thing you've trained yourself to do over several years, sometimes your entire life, and then move forward. You should just be happy that they got Betsy on your Starbucks cut. That's just pretty, um, I, pretty I, impressive because most of the I time they best, don't put the right name. I get B-E-S-T-Y, which is super flattering. And I always tell them, I promise you, I'm not the best. Like, I'm working on it. but yeah, That's all right. They'll recognize, they'll recognize it. Yeah, I love that point, again, about being intentional and being aware of what you're doing. Jason alluded to it earlier with the podcast when we started out and you go back and you listen to yourself and you're not used to doing it. And now we're, I don't know, what are we on? Episode it's, 140, like 140 something, 140 or, somewhere in there. And so we feel like we've gotten better. We're not perfect by any means, but we definitely have gotten better in terms of being comfortable behind the mic and thinking about the words that we're going to use. And there's still some, I like to say again, quite frequently. And I like to say, obviously, mm. however, at the same time, I feel like I'm way better at not saying, um, and not saying, mm -hmm. uh, just, trying not to stutter, just don't but put a, just don't put a camera on. Mike. Yeah. Just don't put a camera in front of you. When you throw the camera on there, we try to do a 15 second little promo for the pot podcast it gets a lot worse so it becomes a lot it becomes a lot more difficult so I, i'm much more comfortable here just sitting behind the mic and and talking at this point but definitely you the first step is being aware of what you're doing and then once you're aware of it then you can start to try to change 
those habits. And we all know that habits are something that are difficult to break and goes back to that word that we continue to come back to over and over again intentionally. You have to be intentional about what it is that you're doing in everything that you do, communication and otherwise. And when you are, then you can make the changes that you're trying to make to be better at whatever it is that you're trying to do. Right. Absolutely. All right. Let's talk about, we've talked a lot about the coach player interaction in the heat of the moment, practice games. What can coaches do to improve their relationship building with players? What are some things or techniques maybe that you might be able to suggest for coaches so that they can build a deeper, more meaningful relationship with players, which kind of circles back to the beginning of our conversation, which is a happy, more engaged team that has a tighter bond is going to tend to perform better. So what can Mm -hmm. coaches do to foster those kinds of relationships? And the short answer that I'm going to say is work on your communication. The way that that translates is, and I'll ask this in workshops that I do, I'll say, and I'll ask you guys, although Mike, you might, you were at the presentation in Chicago, so don't cheat, but there's a <laughs> I'll certain, let Jason, I'm going to let Jason answer. Oh, yeah, no. we'll field this I'm one to the, Jason. So Jason, I'm the pressure <clears throat> on him. there is a buzzword most often associated with high performing teams. Doesn't matter the sport, but when you hit championship season in any sport, there's one word that is most often associated with high performing teams. What's your guess at that one word? Um, it's not communication. Co- he- cohesive. <laughs> No, it starts with a C um, though. Oh, um, I competitive. That's what I'm going to, I don't know. I don't know. I, starts I thought with a C was, yes. ends with an chemistry. Oh, chemistry. Oh, Very cohesive. good. Jason. I like chemistry. Very I good. <laughs> that was good. So chemistry is the buzzword most often associated with high performing teams. Chemistry is created through connection and connection at the heart of connection is communication. If we can become a more intentional about our communication and foster the kind of communication that lends itself to connection, with that connection, we stand to develop chemistry that lends itself to success. So when you ask how can people get better, like start with communication, and that's why this matters. I wanna pivot this a little bit if it's okay, Mike and Jason, and talk about, when we talk about the coach-player relationship and, and establishing that relationship, Going back to that kids these days and talking about Generation Z, is it okay to, to pivot? Absolutely, in that direction? Sure. Okay, so Generation Z, and when we talk about Generation Z, specifically we're talking about individuals born during or after 1996, and these young people that we're coaching today have never known life without the internet. So they've been dubbed the iGen, and they're our nation's first true digital natives. Most of them learned to operate some form of technology before they could form complete sentences. You'll see, you know, parents these days are like, oh, my kid operates my iPhone better than I do. It's a thing. And it's been a thing since about 1996. Knowing things about Generation Z, and I hear coaches more frequently today than ever before saying kids are so different or they've got such short attention spans or I don't know how to connect with them or they they just talk about the Kardashians or they're sitting next to each other and they're texting each other. There's so many different things about Generation Z, and the more we know about who these young people are, the more effectively we stand to coach them. So in general, Gen Z at a glance, typically short attention spans, stunted social skills. They tend to skim read. They digest bite-sized amounts of information at incredible rates. They're highly visual communicators. They're accustomed to chat-based forms of communication, highly educated, industrious, and collaborative. They tend as a generation to be more realistic than optimistic. They value honesty and leadership, and they're data-driven, accustomed to instant expert feedback. And, and this is the kicker, the social media platforms have given Generation Z a high exposure to extrinsic motivation in the forms of likes and shares. So this generation has minimal experience with intrinsic motivation, which for us as coaches becomes a huge challenge. So it's like, okay, great. (laughs) Now what do we do? And this is what I talk with coaches about. So addressing all of those areas and then just giving them some some really tips and tools about how we can navigate the ways in which this youngest generation is different in a way that lends itself to building relationship and generating success. When we talk about eight seconds, eight seconds is the attention span of Generation Z. 8.6 is that of a goldfish. So we have a generation of young people that can hold their attention for less than a goldfish. So our challenge is to communicate in short bursts while making the learning process visual at every opportunity. How do we do that? In terms of communication, 
you can ping pong speakers. So if you as a coach, you speak for 10, 15 seconds and then have your assistant say something and then come back to you. So anytime you change the voice in the room, that causes them to re-engage and pay attention. You can interject questions. So if I'm teaching a drill, as soon as I go through it one time, I say, so we're going to get three lines and then how many passes are we going to make and who needs to get the outlet and let them fill in the gaps so that they're paying attention. Use specific examples whenever possible and say their name. People are primed to pay attention when you say their name. You can do this in individual conversation. If we're talking and all of a sudden I say, Mike, that's a great question. Just that little interjection of your name causes people to snap to attention for a split second. Incorporating movement. So whether I'm using a, a player or many players to physically demonstrate a drill as I'm teaching it, or I teach something and then I have them walk with me and I move to a different spot, changes in movement, changes in location, also cultivate attention. And then any kind of visual representation. So I'm modeling it. Again, I'm demonstrating or I'm using a player to demonstrate or I'm drawing it visually. These are all things that can help combat that eight section that eight second attention span. When we talk about skim reading, so Generation Z has a tendency to consume bite-sized chunks of information. They'll go to a web page if they start to read and they don't find what they're looking for in six seconds, they'll change sources. So our challenge as coaches is to stick to facts and stats and summaries, tendencies, key points, especially when we're talking about written communication. So if you think about things like a scouting report, anytime you can do bullet points, if you can make lists specifically like top three, infographics, this generation is highly visual. So using visuals for facts or percentages that we want to convey. Prioritizing information, so bringing that intentionality in. How can we give them only the most relevant information? I Sometimes I'll do an exercise with coaches called the haiku test. Like if you had to communicate what you want to say to your team in five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables, which is the standard format for a haiku, could you do it? So using being intentional again about our word choice to convey more in less. And then linguistic cues. Here's what you need to know. So again, bringing them to attention with, hey, I'm about to tell you the thing that's really important. This generation as a whole tends to be more accustomed and comfortable to what we call chat-based forms of communication. So our challenge is to operate in their conversational comfort zone while also providing opportunities to engage in longer form written and verbal communications. What that looks like is utilizing technology for individual text or group text. And I'll hear coaches say all the time, like they just want to text. They don't want to talk on the phone. They just want to text. Yes. And at some point, don't fight with it, flow with it. There's this quote about surfing. You can't stop the waves, but you can learn to surf. So how do we learn to surf with this younger generation when it comes to communication? Engage on their level. Invitations to connect. So giving them an optional longer format instead of having a long team meeting or individual team meetings, giving them an option of, hey, if you want to talk about something, here's the times that I'm available. Come talk anytime if there's something that you'd like to discuss. So it's an option, but it's not a requirement. Having five minute meetings or even three minute meetings just to touch base with them individually where you're engaging them in one on one conversation. But it's a very short time frame and they know that. So they know like, oh, crap, I don't know how long coach is going to want to talk to me. <laughs> it's not that. It's like, hey, we're having three-minute meetings. You're scheduled for Monday. You're scheduled for Thursday, whatever it happens to be. But engaging them in longer-form conversations than they might be comfortable with, but there's also a deadline and an end point where they're like, okay, I can do this for three minutes. And then physical positioning, so relatability, sitting beside them versus face-to-face. -face. If there's anything physically in the way, removing that barrier getting on their level. And I'd say this to people when you talk to children all the time, when you're speaking to little kids, that phrase talking down to someone, it has real value and real meaning. When you bend down and you speak to a child on their level, they are much more likely to engage with you than if you're talking down to them. We can do the same thing with people of any age. If they're sitting, sit with them. If you're walking, have them walk with you, walk beside them versus facing them head on. And then conversational comfort. So Location, especially if you're having a difficult conversation, going to an area that's full of natural light, making it a neutral place. Oftentimes I'll ask coaches, where do you have meetings with your players? And they'll say, well, if it's important, I'll have them come to my office. I'll say, great. Is your office your space, their space, or neutral? And they'll say, well, I have an open door policy, so it's our space. Yeah, but it's your office. <laughs> that's your space. So if we think of the office as a coach's space, and let's say the locker room is a player space, even though sometimes players are in the coach's office, Often coaches are in the locker room. What's a neutral space? Well, the neutral space would be a court. 
And people say, well, well, am I just supposed to sit on the bench with them or sit in the stands? Sure. Sit, stand wherever is comfortable. But being physically in that neutral space, now you can have an open conversation. When you're in your office, it's well-intentioned. I have an open door policy. Come anytime. But that's your space. Go to a space that's neutral. Even if it's outside the office, the locker room, the court, go to an outdoor space if possible. But in, be intentional. Again, be intentional about where you're having these conversations. This generation, highly educated, industrious, and collaborative, our challenge as coaches is to find opportunities to co-create with today's student athlete. What that means is allowing for customization of their sport experience through them having agency in the process. This is one that coaches struggle with a lot. They say, but I'm the coach. I tell them how it goes. This is my program. Yes. And it would benefit you because they're so used to customizing every other area of their life through technology. So how can we as coaches allow opportunities for them to co-create? You can do this in simple ways. Team rules. Have them propose fair consequences for team rules that you've established. Allow them to pick two of the warm-up drills that you do. And you can have them lead it individually, rotate the individual that leads it, or you know, have it, if you're coaching a high school or college, have your freshman lead it. Have your soft, like have it be class-led. Doing a player's practice where the players decide what drills you're going to do, and then they lead them. Individual skill work, having the player tell you what they want to work on, why they want to work on it, and then giving them options for when they can work with you on that skill. Having your team write out pregame goals. What are the keys to success? We used to use a three blanks, like three defensive keys, three offensive keys. And we'd write it on the whiteboard next to the scouting report before the game. And before we came in for the pregame meeting, our team would fill in what those are. When they get to tell you what they're committed to, it is so much easier as coaches to hold them accountable. It's not you saying you need to do this. It's them saying, this is what we need to do. This is what we want to do. These are our goals. And then you're simply mirroring them back and reinforcing them. And then, you know, if you do community service with your team, have them choose instead of telling them, oh, we're going to the soup kitchen or, oh, we're going to build a bike with this team. Have them pick. Give them agency. There's small ways that we can allow today's young people to co-create with us that don't take away from our authority as coaches but they definitely lend themselves to that feeling like they are choosing and they're creating intentionally this relationship with us as coaches. I know this is a lot of information. There's only a couple more points to make, so bear with me. Today's generation, Generation Z, highly data-driven. <clears throat> and like I said about the search engine, they'll sift to find the most relevant data. So our challenge as coaches is to make things immediately relevant, to lead with the why. And this is something I talk about with coaches often. But you have to be able to illustrate the current value of what it is you're doing in relation to a larger purpose. So how do we do this? Leading with the why. Explaining the last time we, or let's say if I'm talking about basketball, every time we get out rebounded, we lose. Every time we out-rebound the other team, we win. We're going to start today's practice with a defensive rebounding drill, knowing that when we out-rebound our opponent, we give ourselves the greatest opportunity for success. So leading with the why, because when we just teach something, we put the why at the end, the whole time they're wondering, how does this apply to me? Why does this matter? Anytime we can support with stats, so percentages, metrics, KPIs, which are key performance indicators, anytime you can connect the dots for them. So how does this drill that we're doing relate to this outcome or this goal as a team and connect the dots for them to how they can be successful. And similarly, scale it back, take the big picture and then work it backwards to how does what we're doing right now or the conversation that I'm having or the thing that I'm asking you to work on relate to the larger picture. And then anytime you can make it real. So citing a recent example, again, going back to that, show them, don't tell them. Anytime you can show them and illustrate the value, that's gonna be important. And then the last one's feedback. This generation values honest, immediate feedback. And, and I hear from coaches often, they can't stand criticism. There's always an excuse. They always have a reason why it's not their fault or they're protected by their parents. They really do value honest, immediate feedback. And they live in this world of instant gratification. So our challenge is to use metrics and visuals whenever possible to give objective feedback in real time. There were studies done, I think it was the University of... Georgia, maybe. Don't quote me on that one. But what they found is this generation wants feedback in a way that's calm, caring, and encouraging. So when we say as coaches, they can't take criticism. They can. How we deliver it very much determines how open they are to receiving it. 
So what does that mean for us as coaches? Knowing your audience, going back to that individual, do can you say you, can you say I, do you have to say we? How direct can you be? Framing, and I talk about this with people all the time, how do you ask for what you want based on what the other person values? So framing the context of the conversation in terms of what's most important to the individual that you're talking with. Being specific. The difference between saying good job versus great pass with their name. So being very specific about what was good. And then public ovation. Recognizing, celebrating, acknowledging the behaviors that you want to see publicly and often. Helping individuals identify controllables and uncontrollables. This is something I work with teams on often is what is within your ability to control what's outside of your control. And then as a coach, reminding at every opportunity individuals to focus solely on what they can control and how that lends itself to success. And then when we talk about them being extrinsically motivated, this generation is disproportionately focused on obtaining peer validation. It's so important to them. So our challenge is to help student athletes develop this internal drive for success by strategically praising effort and intent. So illustrating their value separate from likes. How do we do that? Again, validate them, catch them doing it right. So anytime they're successful, acknowledge that. Also acknowledging their effort, even when they fail. Acknowledging the effort in a way that I love that I heard a coach do this is it looks like you're making the right mistakes. So it's okay to fail as long as we're failing in a way that lends itself to success. So challenging them in an environment that's supportive, making it safe to fail, reframing the way that they think about failure. Anytime we can reinforce their value, so what is that individual's unique contribution to the team or to the group? And then celebrating the roles, like they might not have a starting role, heck, they might not even play, but what is their role and how does that add value to the team? And do they know it? And does everybody else know it? And celebrating that. And then allowing space for peer acknowledgement. So a platform for recognition within your program, even if it's two minutes after practice. Like, tell us one thing you like that one of your teammates did today. Awesome way to build relationship within your team, but also play into the things that they need. And lastly, this generation more than any other is used to getting things right away. So there's Google, there's Amazon Prime, there's YouTube. If they don't know something, they can YouTube it, they can learn it. If they want to order something, they can Amazon Prime it, they can get it now. They can have food delivered to their door in a way that <laughs> we've never known before. So our challenge is to help student athletes practice working towards the desired outcome over time while keeping them engaged and informed. So how do we do that? Scheduling feedback now and later. So what can they do today for tomorrow? Illustrating progress towards goals individually and also team like what we did today. This is how it lends itself to what we're looking to do down the road again focusing on controllables and uncontrollables and then and you've started to see this in schools intentionally implementing yoga practices some kind of mindfulness or meditation so intentional breath work that physically somatically allows them to slow down not have that instant gratification, but be able to delay gratification in a controlled way that lends itself to success over time. So I know that was a ton of information, but that's if there's one thing that I really want to impart for audience members, anybody that's listening, when we talk about today's generation, so often I hear people say kids these days, kids these days. Yes, kids these days are different. And when will we stop seeing that as a barrier and instead see it as an opportunity to educate ourselves in a way that allows us to better connect with today's young people. Yeah, I think what I take away from that more than anything else is that many of the coaches from specifically my generation, and I'm 49, and probably there are some coaches that are younger than me in the same vein, is that you can't coach the same way that you were coached in many cases mm -hmm. and it's about learning new modalities new different ways of doing things that are benefiting the kids that you have in front of you and not trying to fit them into a box that no longer exists but mm -hmm. trying to adjust what you do adjust the box that you're trying to put them into so that it better fits them and i i go through everything that you just said and there were a ton of practical suggestions in there that if coaches are out there and take some notes about what you just said, there's a ton of practical information that they can take right away today and start applying that with their teams immediately and start to see results. I want to ask you one more question before we wrap up. Sure. And that is most coaches who are out there 
have some type of relationship with, whether it's their spouse, wife, girlfriend, somebody that is in their life that while they're coaching their wife, their <laughs> husband, their girlfriend, their boyfriend, whatever the case may be, that person has to provide them with the kind of support to allow them to do what we do as coaches. So right. can you give us one, maybe two tips for helping us to better communicate with our spouses? And then we'll wrap up by letting you share your contact information and all that good stuff. <laughs> sure. And I'll say in part, that's, that's why I have a job. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, in my, you know, various stops throughout coaching as a player and then as a coach, I absolutely saw a need for there to be someone for coaches that wasn't their significant other or family member or spouse that could could be there as an outside person to either absorb the breath of what it is that they're going through or help them do things that they've yet to do so they can be who they've yet to be. So largely in the work that I do with with individuals, I am that person. Knowing that not everyone has that resource, um, recommendations, I think the more that you can communicate to whomever it is that you're talking with, if you are a coach, about what you need. So, and I I say this with coaches communicating with parents as well, expectations, setting expectations early so that people understand how this goes. And I'll hear from spouses or or significant others of coaches, male and female, you know, oh, so-and-so is so bad after a game, or if it's a loss, I know I can't talk to them for, you know, however long. (laughs) Just just asking for what you need. And this is recommendations really for anybody. There's that, that great quote, we teach other people how to treat us. And it's really true. But the more that, again, we're intentional about articulating, hey, win or loss, it would help me to have 30 minutes in the car home to to talk about what happened tonight. Or conversely, I, after the game, win or loss, I, I just need some space to think about what it is that happened and how our team can get better. So asking for what you need would be the first piece of advice. And then also setting expectations. And sometimes as a listener, we can do this more effectively with anybody is asking them, you know, are you looking for advice? Are you looking for someone just to listen and getting clear on that in the beginning of the conversation, when people start to unload before we jump into giving advice when it's not wanted. So, so just, (laughs) just clarify again, it comes back to clarity, but the more we can clarify to each other, what we need, what we want, what would be helpful. And then also if you're going to get intentional about something, Spending time thinking about the questions that you ask and then asking yourself if you can think of better questions. Ask questions that leave space for people to articulate how they're feeling or what they need or or where their pain points are or their frustrations. Creating intentionally that space and, and that's something I wish we did more often as a society in general is putting down the phone, turning off the TV, minimizing the distractions and simply giving our time to somebody else. The most limited resource we have and we think we have so much of it and that's part of the problem is our time and because of that it's one of the greatest gifts that we can give to another person and when you give someone your time being intentional about it giving them your full attention listening to them for whatever duration they need and if it's too long articulating them this is important to me i want to hear more of this i need to get this done first can we come back to this conversation whatever happens to be but when you give your time be fully present i think that's one of the most beautiful gifts and and gifts of value that we can ever give another person. Great advice. That's a super way to end it. If you wouldn't mind, Betsy, before we wrap up, just share how people can get in touch with you, where they can find out what you do, and then we'll wrap up the episode after that. Absolutely. You can go to my website, Betsy Butterick. The last name is B-U-T-T-E-R-I-C-K. So BetsyButterick.com. There's a contact form there. You can send me whatever your issue happens to be, anything that you want to talk about, a question that you have. I would love to hear from you. On Twitter, you can find me at Betsy Butterick. So again, first name, last name. And then on Instagram, it's Betsy underscore the coach's coach. And all one word, the coach's coach is how you can find me on Instagram. But again, check out the ACT videos for anybody listening, whether you're a parent, whether you're a coach, whether you're a teacher, whether you're just a human being. And I say just knowing that that's a very complicated occupation. If you check out the ACT videos, again, I believe there's 26 of them, but they are designed to give people in a very short amount of time something that you can do today to improve your effectiveness as a communicator and your ability to connect with other people. So search my name on YouTube, check out the ACT videos, subscribe to the channel, 
and again, please reach out if I can be of help to anyone. This is the thing I'm most passionate about is helping people become better communicators, knowing the way that communication improves all areas of our life. So if I can be of service, please reach out. Absolutely. I think anyone who who has listened to the episode tonight, uh, you've gotten a chance to hear what Betsy's all about and the passion and knowledge that she brings to this particular area of communication. And so I would highly recommend getting in touch with her, whether it's through her website or through one of the social media channels that she just mentioned. Uh, Make sure you do that. Betsy, we can't thank you enough for spending an hour and a half with us tonight and sharing your time and taking that time out of your schedule. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. And to everyone out there, we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Head Start Basketball's Player Development Academy offers Cleveland area players a unique opportunity to improve their basketball skills. Regardless of a player's age, skill level, or position, training with Head Start Basketball will elevate your game to the next level. Do you want to improve your ball handling, become a better shooter, or develop into a more skilled, confident player? Our academy classes offer training that's designed to do just that. Our training sessions are innovative and will have you learning skills that are transferable to actual games. We have four different class skill levels for boys and girls, ages four and up. All Player Development Academy classes will be held at the Strongsville Recreation Center. For more information or to get registered, please visit www.headstartbasketball.com. Thanks for listening to the Hoopheads Podcast, presented by Head Start Basketball.